So as many of you might know, uh, we've, as a general federalist, we've um, been keeping up with issues having to do with banking and monetary policy, and we have a lot of ideas about that. So one of the subjects uh, that we've um, taken a particular interest in, because it, it is key and central to the, it's the, really the entire political picture, um, is this, this issue of um, fractional reserve, well, monetary policy, fractional reserve banking, and, um, you know, how, how money gets created. And, and, you know, just looking on YouTube and going through Google, it's, it's really evident that for some reason, well, for re as I shouldn't say some reason, there's a good reason, um, but for good reason, the public is, is thoroughly confused over this, obviously, from, from looking at the YouTube videos and looking at um, everything that's been said on Google. Uh, it's, it's astonishing how, how much urban legend and stuff is out there. I mean, I could say, um, you know, I, I could say that, uh, you know, look, I, I'm in a position to know what I'm talking about. 
and I'm telling you the way it really works. Um, but obviously, um, you know, as a credibility issue, what, what you really need are the reputable sources. So um, I'll give you those sources uh, when we're done so that you can verify what I'm telling you. But um, the, what, 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 I haven't found a single video on YouTube, for example, where the way this works is actually explained correctly. So um, there, there are kind of two levels of understanding, apparently, and they're disjointed. So it's like uh, some people understand some parts of it, and some people understand other parts, but few people seem to really no one that we've been able to find seems to under, on the internet seems to understand the whole thing and really the whole thing is not complicated it's not huge not at least not as far as our purposes are concerned here um, the, the, the the thing is what, what we're trying to understand is and the reason why general Federalists looked at this was because of our development of what's called fiducial economics and in developing that and then in developing zero zero banking uh, we needed to understand uh, how all of that works both traditionally and, and how it could work in, in a new system so um, one thing that that is a common misunderstanding that probably you know should be clarified right up front is that the, for some and this is not everyone by any means I'm not you know I'm not pointing fingers or saying anyone does or doesn't know this you just have to humor me on this if you already know this stuff but, um, one of the things, though, that is a common misunderstanding is this apparent implicit assumption that currency and wealth are the same thing, and they're not. They're entirely, completely different things. Um, some people say they know that, but then in their in their writings and in their YouTube videos and stuff, it's evident that they don't. So it's important to make that distinction right up front. The other thing is is that um, the way that um, the, the way that it's talked about. So you hear in the news a lot, you know, people um, in the, in the financial sector, people who were, you know, who work for the Federal Reserve, for example, they talk about things in terms that are re really um, higher level and probably misleading for someone who really wants to understand what it really means. Um, and wealth tends to get treated that way a lot. So they'll talk about goods and services. You'll hear that buzz phrase. You'll hear things like capital flows or capital. Um, you'll hear things like uh, uh, monetizing, which is related to that, um, but in, in debt, um, you'll, you'll hear a lot of terms thrown about. Um, and then when people start talking about, as well, when people start talking about what money is, and they start trying to define that, they'll say, well, you know, money only has to be um, backed by the, by the belief in the public that it has value. And that the whole idea of value is just that it's worth something to, to in the market. But, but, but that definition completely skirts what, what, what the real connection is. Um, the real connection is, is that money is simply a metric. It's like a yardstick. It always has been, always will be. That's what it was invented for. All it does is measure wealth. That's its sole purpose. So the purpose of of currency is simply to measure the amount of wealth um, in, in a you know in a given defined collection. So um, one way to understand it more easily um, and to help us define you know at least for the sake of discussion what that 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 collection is is to just think of the aggregate wealth of, of an entire country. It's a simplification, but it helps. If you think of the aggregate wealth of the United States, for example, then there's a certain amount of currency in circulation, electronic, paper, all forms that represents that wealth. And when you understand that currency is just a metric that measures wealth, <clears throat> then you understand inflation and deflation right away. It's very simple. It's not complicated at all. Because if you if you add more currency to that pile without changing the wealth, then you have more currency uh, per unit of wealth than you did before. So obviously the value of the dollar, you know, it it uh, it drops because there's now more money in circulation. If you take the yardstick and you make it longer, then you know the value of each unit um, is less. So, or I should say, if you take the yardstick, yeah, and you expand it, increase it, increase the units on it, then the units are worth less. And conversely, if you take the yardstick and shorten it, the units become more valuable. They represent bigger chunks of wealth. So that's assuming the wealth doesn't change. But if the wealth doesn't change, 
then you, you can't or you shouldn't um, change the amount of currency in circulation. That would be bad. So the whole the whole idea behind monetary policy is to try to 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 keep that balance. But the problem is, the complication is, is that that wealth is always changing. It's always changing. Usually in the United States, it's going up. It's increasing. So the trick for monetary policymakers is how to figure out the rate and the amount by which wealth is growing, because that determines how much currency you need in circulation. And we'll talk a little bit more about why there's so much currency printing going on in the United States right now. There's a reason for that. It's because wealth is changing. Or the wealth of the dollar is supposed to represent is changing um, drastically since globalization. But anyway, as for the creation of money, then uh, the old wives tell about you know it being bad to print money um, is just a, a wives tell. It's not true. Uh, there's nothing wrong inherently with printing money. The, the problem is is when you print too little or too much. That's the problem. You have to print money in order to get it in circulation and in order to adequately reflect the total aggregate wealth of a nation, for example. Um, if that wealth changes, then you have to increase the currency. You must print money. If, if you didn't print money, you wouldn't have any money, first of all. But, you know, obviously you have to print money. And the, the people think you shouldn't print money. Uh, just black and white shouldn't print it. That's a, a bit simplistic. And then there's the, the whole gold standard thing. People think that, well, you know, we should be based on gold. Now, Again, if you remember that currency represents wealth, and the saying is currency chases wealth, then what you realize is, is that gold is just another form of wealth. That's all it is. It's one particular form of wealth that became popular because it was so uh, value dense. Um, a very small amount was worth a lot, which meant that you could carry it around easily, or more easily than anything else. And everyone wanted it. So it was universal. You could trade it for anything. Um, that's why it got used. But still, it's merely a representation of what? Now, when your economy gets so big that you need currency to reflect the wealth of the entire country in order to make it more usable, gold doesn't work because gold is only a tiny fraction slice of all of that wealth. So where people get the idea that we should be on a gold standard, I, I don't understand if they understood the, the connection between currency and wealth, they would immediately see that doesn't make any sense. It makes sense for an economy that's relatively small with respect to the available amount of gold. But once the wealth of a nation greatly exceeds the aggregate total wealth of gold available, then you are hobbling the economy. You're holding it back if you make it dependent on uh, only a tiny fraction of the world's work, work, uh, wealth. It's just see a long time ago that that gold, you know, there was a time when that gold was such a large proportion of the world's wealth, in fact, so many times more than the world's wealth uh, in total, that it works, it worked quite, it worked quite well. Um, so anyway, that covers that. So when you create money, what you have to do is you have to create money at a rate and in an amount that matches the change in wealth. That's what the Fed is for. That's what the Federal Reserve does. That's its primary job. Yeah, that's 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 it. It's, it's that simple. It's not that complicated. Now they've inherited an ancient system, an antiquated system that does make it more complicated than it needs to be. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but first, one of the one of the the myth, the mythology about it begins. When people start talking about some of the particular Fed rules around um, fractional reserve banking, so fractional reserve banking means that, as, as you may already probably know, is that you know um, you for all your deposits you peel off a, a percentage or a fraction of that and put it in a reserve, and then you can loan out the rest. That's essentially what fractional reserve means. And if you think about that. You realize that if that were all it were, if that was the only issue, and frankly, that's probably not something that banks would want the public to know, because what it means is, is that banks can loan out more money than they have, and then draw interest off of that. So it, it, it's a little dishonest. There's been controversy about that, you know, for over 100 years. That's always been known, and it's always been controversial. So a lot of people are talking about it on the internet as if that is the only issue. And like that's a big deal. Well, that's missing the point because that's you know um, 
nothing compared to what the real concern is. Um, and then there are people who are taking that rule and uh, misunderstanding it mathematically. So they're applying it incorrectly, um, and they're trying to say that money is being created out of thin air because of that rule, and that's mathematically false. It's, it's, that doesn't happen. So all that means is, is that all that rule by itself means is that when you deposit money or when a bank receives deposits, it can loan out more money than it has, and all that's happening is, is money is just changing hands. It's not multiplying, it's just changing hands. So if someone deposits $10,000, in the United States, and in the vast majority of cases, that, that reserve requirement is 10%. So if someone deposits $10,000 in my bank, I can put 1000 in reserve, and I can loan out 9000 Okay, So if you think about it, it makes sense. And this all came as a result of the Depression. I mean, the people wanted some structure behind this so that people couldn't get carried away. They didn't want people loaning out more than that because it would obviously cause problems with runs on the bank. If banks loaned out, you know, kept loaning out money they didn't have, well, obviously, you know, um, people are going to have problems if they all want their money back, if all the depositors want their money back uh, at the same time. So that that's where that came from. And so a bank can loan out, like I said, you know, uh, 9,000 of that depositor's money in that case, in that example. They're free to loan that out. So as you can see, there's really, the only thing that's specious about this really is more of a, an age-old objection that's been around, at least amongst those who are fairly familiar with finance, that, you know, look, uh, it's not really fair that a bank can loan out money like that and make interest when, you know, off of something it doesn't really have. Um, well, whether that's true or not depends on how it's being loaned out, whether or not they really have it or not. Um, if, you, if you know, you know, the requirement is, um, the, the Fed requirement is simply that they put 10% of their deposit in reserve. That's it. It doesn't say that they can loan out more than they have. What it's, I mean, for example, if someone comes in and drops in ten thousand dollars, you could put one thousand in reserve and you could loan out nine thousand, and you're you're not in the red because you have depositor money there backing that loan. The reserve was to protect the depositor. That's really what it's about. Because if the depositor came back for their money and you had loaned it out, then yeah, that'd be a problem. And that would be money you don't have. But I'm just making this distinction because it doesn't mean that the bank then has to print money, right? I mean, it's just because of that. Uh, they don't have to create money out of thin air just because of that. Because they have the deposit. Someone came in and they deposited $10,000. You had the $9,000 in pocket, which you could then loan out. So you didn't have to create anything. You just loaned out the depositor's money. That's the specious part, the, the moral question. But nothing's being printed. Nothing's being created out of thin air yet. So this is what, and this is huge on the internet. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it, it seems like 90% of all of the commentators, all of the YouTube videos, they're all saying this. That somehow this is fraudulent. That this is making money out of thin air. The, the problem I have with this is that I, I do, as you, if you've seen my website, our website really, it's a team of us, but if you've seen that website, it's, it should be obvious that um, we, we're, we're determined to uh, share what we know and to illuminate to the extent that we can. So um, that's what concerns us, is that this is distracting from what is really going on. People are not learning what is actually going on because they're hearing a bunch of crap. And that means that they're ill-informed, and that means that apologists for, like, the Federal Reserve can easily um, shut them down if this ever becomes, like, really popular. Um, it'll be easy enough because people are just going to go repeat this, and they're going to they're gonna look stupid. Well, I won't say that, but they're gonna, people are going to try to make them look stupid because they're going to they're gonna show that it's wrong, and it is wrong. They're not, they're not, they're not printing anything out of thin air. At this point. Now, that has been somewhat of a secret in the banks. They don't really like people to know that. They have it for years. Most people haven't known it. Not until the information age came along. Then people started finding out about that. 
But there's a much deeper secret. It's much more zealously guarded, and they do zealously guard it. And you have to ask, I mean, I, I don't know, there's no way I can know, but you have to ask when they created the Federal Reserve, was this delivered or not? Because it sure is brilliantly deceptive. Um, if they stumbled across it, it was, it was an incredible circumstance or coincidence. But here's, here's what they've done. They've created this reserve rule. Then they've modeled another, I guess you can call it a rule, another rule, uh, kind of a parallel rule to that, that mirrors that. And the question is, which rule were they trying to create first? The one I'm about to explain or the one I already did? Um, which one were they really trying to start? Or start what, what were they really trying to create? Is one just ancillary to the other? And which way does that go? So anyway, there's something to think about. If, um, <clears throat> let's see, make sure I've explained everything I need to explain before I go on, because I want to be sure that we're clear about the meaning of all these things. So, um, so we know what wealth is. Um, yeah, and we know that. Okay, so let me let me just start with uh, the way I'll do this is I'll start with the loan process, and I'll walk through that, and then we'll get to the second part that way. That's probably the better way. So, you go to the bank for a loan, and you want to loan ten thousand dollars. Let's say the bank gives it to you. Then you sign a promissory which is basically a legal obligation to repay a loan. Um, you say you're going to pay it back, and you're going to pay it back with interest and everything that was specified. And then the bank gives you the money. They give you a check for $10,000. Here's what actually happens. Here's what's actually going on. They give you the check for $10,000. Let's say you, now let's, let's call this Bank A. Let's say this is Bank A. Uh, I'm using actual Fed language now. So uh, you walk out of Bank, bank A, and you go over to bank B, which is your bank, and you deposit that $10,000 check in your bank. But you are paranoid, so you, you, you're you very careful. So when you go to bank B, you deposit that check, but you demand that the check be honored, that you walk out of there with cash. Now, a lot of banks nowadays won't do that, but um, unless you go to the bank on which it was drawn, but... Let's just assume they said, okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. We'll, we will give you the full $10,000 in cash. No problem. Here you go. Okay. So what you're probably thinking is, based on the rule that we've already been over, the first part of this rule about reserves, is that it must be the case then that, um, that Bank A, at least fractionally in, in, in the case of my loan, must have had a deposit on hand, which was uh, at least, what, 10% of that? A little bit more. Yeah, a little bit more than that. So like 1100 something like that. But anyway, the point is, they must have had a 10% reserve for that loan. Because um, it would be 10% be of the total amount, so whatever that was. So, um, and then the remainder would be 10000 That's what I borrowed. So, you would, you would assume right off the bat then that, okay, that means that Bank A must have had something over $10,000, we won't worry about the math, and that 10% of that was held in reserve, and then the remainder was $10,000, and that's what they loaned. So when I get this check cash, I'm assuming that Bank B is going to go call Bank A and say, look, um, this guy just came over here and cashed a check from your bank for $10,000, and we want our money. Because your check is a promise to pay that amount. So quite naturally, bank, bank B is going to call Bank A and say, I want my $10,000. And then Bank A, presumably, because they gave you the loan, right? So presumably, they're going to say, oh, sure, no problem. We have it right here. We put it aside. And we did the loan. And we'll send it to you right away. Here it is. Right? But that's not how it works. Well, what people have to understand is, and I think this is the part that's so zealously hidden, um, what you have to understand is, is that the bank is not calling the bank. Um, in fact, there's no communication between the banks at all, really. Not normally. It's not necessary. There's a third party that does this. There's a third party intermediary that does this. They handle all the bank transactions. All of them. They're called the Federal Reserve. So you see, all of this uh, transaction 
between banks is occurring through the Federal Reserve. Now, what does the Federal Reserve do when it sets up this reserve requirement? Ah, yes, well, remember, the Fed is a bank. So it tells all these banks that, hey, guess what? You're going to have to open an account with us. Right to create your reserve accounts. So your reserve is not held at your bank. No, 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 no. You don't. It's not in your vault. Not at all. You're going to open an account with us called your reserve account, and that reserve account is where you're going to put all your reserves. We control that. You see. And there's also another account which holds, you know, basically the rest of your deposit. So someone comes in and they deposit money, and you know. And this is if you do a loan now, um, not not every deposit, but anything used for a loan, that 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 portion of it is going to be deposited in a second type of a, of account you have with the Federal Reserve. So in the case of let's say a ten thousand dollar deposit, there would be a reserve account where Bank A would have to put a thousand dollars in their Bank A reserve account at the Federal Reserve, and then they would have to take the nine thousand and put it in the other account, the loan account basically. Um, also at the Federal Reserve. So you see, none of this is being controlled by the banks. And this is what people don't understand. So, well, there's more to it. There's more, there's more they don't know. Um, so, and its implications. So, what this means is, when Bank B says, I want my $10,000, they don't go to Bank A and ask for it. They go to the Federal Reserve and ask for it. Because, you know, they also have their own reserve and loan accounts there, too. But they're asking the Federal Reserve to do a transfer. They're saying, look, we just got this check from Bank A, and Bank A has an account with you. They've got their reserve account. They've got their loan account. Now give us the damn money. That's what Bank B is going to say, presumably, you would think. And maybe they do, but the point is this. And here's what people don't know. The Federal Reserve does not... Let me repeat that. Does not take the money from the loan account held by Bank A out of that account and move it over to the loan account or any other account for Bank B. In fact, it does nothing with it. The loan account, if you will, set up for Bank A is not touched when the check arriving at Bank B is honored. They are disconnected within the Federal Reserve. The banks never see this. The banks have nothing to do with it. And this is where we get into that part I was talking about where this sure does look intentional. Because, you know, the real, the meat of this operation is occurring within the Federal Reserve. It's not even occurring in the bank. The bankers don't know this. The local bankers don't know. They don't know anything. And part of the reason why they're clueless is because part of what the Fed did when they set these rules up is they said, look, you're going to have to set up this loan, uh, this, basically this loan account with us, where your loan money is, but, 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 you know, you know what, here's the deal, because we're such a big bank, and because we have so much loan money, and since these people are going to be paying the loans back anyway, right, um, you don't really have to leave it there, right, you're free to draw from that account as you please, add to it, take out, do whatever you want, uh, and so, so, so Bank A can, with its loan account, not its reserve, it has to leave the reserve alone, but its loan account, it can withdraw from it, take money out, put money in, do whatever it wants. Now, if you're, if you're in business for a profit, um, I can tell you what's going to happen, and I can tell you what actually de facto does happen 99% of the time. You're going to deposit that money as the Fed requires, and about one second later, you're going to flip a switch and it's going to come right back to you. That's what's going to happen. Now, what's really brilliant about this, and why this is, I'm bringing one of the, another reason why I'm talking about this is it illustrates what we as general federalists talk about so much about neoliberal Western democracies, the fraud of them, through what we call moral hazard, which in turn causes the subordination of rule of law. Because you see, there is a law, there are laws against theft in this country. This is subordination of that law, and I'll explain how in a minute, but it starts with moral hazard. See, the Fed, you know, again, whether it's intentional or not, it's brilliant because it does at least keep the Fed's hands a little cleaner, right? Because it's not like they're taking the money out. <laughs> they're just telling the bank, you can leave it there, that's fine, or you can take it out. 
but you can see obviously what that is going to result in. That's called a moral hazard. If the Fed has an account open like that, of course the banker is going to take it out. Of course they're going to remove every bit of it one second after it's deposited. They're not going to leave it there. They're going to take the money out. They always do. And that's going to be their profit and their operating expenses and so on. So the bank president and the, the accountant, who are probably going to be the most knowledgeable people at the bank, really don't even realize anything's going on even still. Because to them, the Fed has told them, look, we, we're a big bank, and well, they are a big bank. And we have all kinds of loan accounts, so don't worry. Because we got this guy's loan money, and we'll pay it. Trust us, we're government. Well, not really, kind of quasi-government. But we'll pay it. That's what they're telling the bankers. And the bankers have no reason not to believe that. Because the Fed is the clearinghouse, quote unquote, the clearinghouse for all banking transactions. That's what they're supposed to do. So they're supposed to pay it. So no worries. The banker says, okay, got it. You're going to pay that. And as this loan is paid back, you know, um, it'll be covered. It's not a big deal. Now, Smart bankers and accountants may see through this. It's, it's not that hard to see through, but the problem is, is when you create a moral hazard that huge, even when people see through it, they, they'll justify it and ignore it. And that's generally what happens. They don't really ask questions. Almost all of the knowledge about how this works is held solely by the Federal Reserve. Right? So unless, you, unless you're in the walls or you have connections with people in the Federal Reserve, you're not you're never going to know this. I mean, if you went to the same college and we're in the same, you know, secret society, you, you know, you might know, you might know how the Fed works because you got a friend that works there. But you know, how many people are in that position? Um, the vast majority of people that know this are just people in the Fed. Um, so anyway, that's how that works. So what the Fed does, and to, to be clear. To make good on this loan check at Bank B, here's what they're going to do. They're going to credit Bank B's appropriate account with $10,000 electronically. Right? There's your thin air. Because you see, nothing happened. They didn't take any money out of Bank A's account, out of any account. This is de novo of new. This is a de novo transaction, a de novo uh, currency production. So they dump the whatever they loan, ten thousand dollars, they dump ten thousand dollars into Bank B's account. It's new money. So you see, it's not tied to the reserve rule in the way you would intuitively think it would be. And there again, that's why you ha I have to ask, is this deliberate? Because it's so clever. I mean, I don't know if it is, but it's so clever. Because people are going to be inclined to say, "Oh well, yeah, that's that's the, that's the reserve rule," you know. Uh, but 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 you know, when you tell them, "Oh well, wait a minute," you know, um, actually they're you know they're they're actually crediting the account, you know, from nowhere. You're going to hear a lot of objections of, "No, no, you don't understand. It, it's this is the this is just the fractional reserve rule. That's all. You're misunderstanding that." I don't know, it's very clever. But anyway, this is not the same thing as the reserve rule, not exactly. It's a twist on it. What the, let's say we had a $10,000 deposit. Now let's say, let's talk about bank B's deposit, $10,000. Now let's say they want to loan that out. Well, now they have to put aside $1,000 and they can loan out $9,000. What these rules are really saying is, to be clear, is that the Fed authorizes bank B to loan an amount of 9000 out to anyone. Uh, said another way, the Fed is saying if you loan out 9000 in other words, the appropriate uh, reserve fraction, uh, then we will create that money on behalf of that loan. We will do it. We will create that money by flipping a switch and crediting the account at whatever bank that check ultimately gets cashed out. Wherever it's ultimately cashed, we'll flip that switch. So even if it's your own bank, there's, it's still going through the Federal Reserve clearinghouse system. So even that bank doesn't know that, that, that their own, uh, you know, that, 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 that money has just been created in their own bank. 
They're clueless. That's the whole point, I think. I have to wonder anyway. So anyway, that's how it works. And uh, there is no, and, and this is how people get so confused over this, because they think that, you know, this whole uh, having to hold a reserve back is multiplying money. No, that's not multiplying money. What's multiplying money is when the Fed starts flipping switches. That's what's multiplying money. And yes, the multiplier equation is correct. I mean, when they produce the, you know, the 10,000 comes in and they do 9,000 and then, you know, they can loan out 9,000. And then when that 9,000 gets deposited, there's 8,100 available for loaning, right? So that, that, that sequence that people talk about does occur. It does happen. It that does work that way. But again, it's just an authorization rule. It's an authorization algorithm is all it is. So, and, and, and they don't have to know where the money came from, by the way. They don't have to track all of this because the rule applies the same way in, in every case. It's, it's simply 10%, whatever it is. So if they loan, you know, if there's a $9,000 deposit, they can loan out, you know, 10% um, of that. And, and, and uh, no, they, get, they, can, they have to put aside 10% uh, reserve and they can loan out the remainder. And that works out to be $8,100 that they can loan for the $900 reserve. So that process repeats, but again, it's just an authorization algorithm. It tells it tells the Fed how they're going to authorize these things and the banks, you know, what they can do. So the bank can request or report this to the Fed. They can, and the way they're reporting it is, is they're doing that initial money drop into their loan account. That's how the Fed knows. See, they're communicating with the Fed, importing information, and they don't even really know they're communicating. Um, it's, it's extraordinary how sophisticated this entire system is and how well it works. I mean, this was around a long time ago. Um, you, they used to do it by paper, but, you know, they still didn't know anything. It was done in such a way that you didn't really know what, what the Fed was doing. Um, so, anyway. So, this now leads us to what is the, really the problem? Because now that's all wrapped up in public myth and I should say more like urban legend. Um, because people don't even understand what's going on, so they don't even understand how to interpret it. There's all kinds of confusion about that. It's unbelievable, all the different angles I've heard. So, currency chases wealth. Okay? So, when you went to the bank and you asked for a loan, you created the money. Indirectly, by proxy, you created the money. Because you signed a loan. And the loan authorized the bank to uh, credit another bank's account wherever you went and deposited the, your, your proceed check. So you did it. Here's the problem though, and here's what is, so be is being so zealously hidden. People have completely missed the big secret. <laughs> it is a big secret. It really is. Um, the secret is this. It's got to have anything to do with creating money out of thin air. It's got nothing to do with all the stuff you've heard. Here's what it has to do with. You have to ask yourself, when you ask for a loan, if money, if currency chases wealth, then you should only print money, or create money, whatever, whatever, if the wealth, aggregate wealth itself changes, then what the hell is a loan? What do you think a loan is? A loan is merely asking, it's basically a request for a print run. That's all it is, you're saying, you're, you're saying that when I loan this money, if you're saying I'm going to go build a Home Depot, when I borrow this money, I'm going to go build a Home Depot. And that money is going to immediately get converted into new wealth. Not just old. New wealth. That means that the aggregate wealth of the country has increased. There must be currency there to represent it. This is how the Fed tracks wealth. It's part of the method. This is what they're doing. So they have that algorithm. They use it when they do their math. They've gotten very good at this. Okay? That algorithm of, you know, loaning only the remainder after the reserve is set aside, you know, for each deposit. Um, so, anyway, um, you are creating new wealth. A better way to look at this, though, instead of uh, saving money for maybe a Home Depot, um, well, we'll do that next. For now, let's, let's stick with the Home Depot. All right, if you borrow that money from the Home Depot, 
Somebody had to come build that building. That would be a construction team had to come build that building. This is new wealth we're talking about now. And then when the store was running, employees had to be hired to run it. Which generated revenue for Home Depot, which is new wealth. Because it wasn't there before. Even though it's still represented in currency, there's still new wealth behind that. Because it wasn't there before. But importantly, whoever labored um, in the construction of that, of, the, of that Home Depot created new wealth. So the print run, in other words, the loan you took from the bank, belongs to who? Who does it belong to? Does it belong to a bank? Does it belong to the Fed? Does it belong to the president? Does it belong to – who does it belong to? Well, if the wealth of the nation, the aggregate wealth of the nation increases – as a direct result of the Home Depot you built with the loan you requested, then the currency that was just, quote, printed, if you will, and handed to you through the, through the actions of the Federal Reserve I just described, there has been a print run by the Federal Reserve to adjust and compensate for the creation of new wealth and the construction of that Home Depot. So. The currency that was printed should have been dispersed by rule of law and equity. It should have been dispersed to the people that built the home people. It's their money. It always was because they produced the wealth. This is, this is fraud and theft. Because the, the, the contracting workers, the, 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 the team that built that building, they're the ones that created that new wealth. So it's manifestly clear that the print run being done to represent that wealth it has to go to them. There's no, there's no one else it, it would legitimately go to. Equity and law would require – this went to court in an honest court. Equity and law would require that the judge rule that all of that print run must go equitably to all of those people that, that worked on it. Equitably meaning not equally, but according to how much time they put into it and all this stuff. Uh, their pay rate and all that stuff. It would be proportionate to that. This is the lie that's been hidden from me. It's got nothing to do with all this bullshit you're hearing about on YouTube. I'm astonished at the level of bullshit and that people are missing this point. It's, it's disturbing. It's frustrating. Because you see, this isn't complicated. It's not that complicated. It's pretty simple. So anyway, there it is. Uh, I've explained it. I hope it's clear. If it's not, you can email us, uh, any one of us. Um, uh, you, you can email probably Carcomric is the best one. But you can go to our website, HTTP, you know, uh, K-I-R-K-O-M-R-I-K dot WordPress dot com or federalism.jux.com. These are the two bigger federal general federalism sites out there. All this stuff is explained in gross detail. There. So if you want more information, you can get it there. But the point is, is that um, that's the big secret. And if you sit down and do the math, here's, here's the funny part. When you, when you take these uh, Fed algorithms and run them backward, you start, doing, you start performing the math, you, you, you find out that uh, rather astonishingly, um, the compensation uh, in, in terms of rates, because everybody makes different amounts, but in terms of rates, uh, the, the compensation rates for people that work in this country um, are approximately one-tenth of what they should be by equity and law. If rule of law were followed and by equity and law, it is about one-tenth what it should be. This is why Western neoliberal democracies have no rule of law, even though they, they talk about it all the time. It doesn't exist here. It's a fraud. The whole thing's a fraud. The whole thing's a scam. Um, so there you go. If you make, you know, I don't know, whatever, twenty dollars an hour. Well, you know, it ought to be two hundred an hour. That's what's been going on. That's what they're terrified of. They're terrified that people are going to find it out, especially since the information age. That's why you're seeing a lot of weird behavior, actually. By the way, in the last ten years, it's because they're terrified of this. This is what it is. People are already finding out, but um, anyway, I'm just talking about it because look, it's it's already out there. It's, it's not. There's no point trying to hide it. What, what needs to be done is that we need to figure out how to fix it. 
um, and to, and to their, in their defense, in the, in the defense of bankers, I would say that, look, this has been going on for 300 years. And technologically, they didn't have a way to do it any differently, even just 50 years ago. Only with computer technology, only with basically the technology that the Federal Reserve has now for being this clearinghouse. Could you come up with an alternative system that would actually be uh, equitable? And so in their defense, you know, they inherited the system. Yeah, they're benefiting big time, hugely. But what are they supposed to do? They're going to come out on TV and say, oh, by the way, you know, just kidding. Um, you know, we ripped you off to the tune of trillions and trillions of dollars. No, they can't. That's the problem. And they're struggling with how to get out of this mess. Um, and my suggestion is honesty. But anyway, that's it for now. Um, check out our other videos on all of these topics. And I uh, hope that explained it well.